Indy or AAA? Indy. AR or VR? AR. IAPs or ads? Both. <laughs> You're listening to Level Up with Melissa Zalouf. So welcome back everyone. I'm Melissa Zalouf and you're listening to Level Up, the podcast for people who love making, growing, and of course, playing mobile games. Today on the show, we have Erin O'Brien, head of culture at Graham Games, and we're gonna be talking about the secret sauce to building really great culture at gaming companies. Erin, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So um, tell us a bit about yourself. You're the head of culture at Graham Games. Yes, I am. But your background is in public affairs with some trouble (laughs) writing thrown in. Um, How and why did you end up working in the gaming industry and in Istanbul of all places. Yeah, so I went to Princeton and I graduated with a degree in Near Eastern Studies with focuses on Persian Studies and Gender Studies. Sure. And uh, yeah, so I had studied abroad in Istanbul. I had met the awesome team at Graham and I'd visited their offices quite early on and kind of started doing content develop for them, development for them. And as I was looking for jobs as I was graduating, uh, I kind of found no better company uh, I found myself <laughs> on this search of like, okay, I've, I've, you know, I've had this experience with Graham Games. I've spent over a year now collaborating with them. What else would match that? Mm. And nothing did. Nothing did. So I kind of told them that I wanted to move back to Istanbul full time. They were like, okay, cool. So I moved over. So you had been doing content development for them in the States? Yes. So I'd been doing it while I was still uh, at school. Um, and yeah, and so then I moved over, continued work on that arena, but moved on to the people and culture team. And then over the course of time, I kind of assumed a role that combined um, internal culture and internal operations and people ops, as well as PR. People ops. People ops so nice. Key critical <laughs> buzzwords. Um, but uh, uh, that uh, combined that with you know communications and PR and kind of external visibility, because ultimately those two are pretty intrinsically linked. I think mm-hmm. because you know my job is both to work with an incredible team to maintain um, the internal stability of the company, but then also to ensure that the world knows what we're doing and that the world is aware of what we have going on inside of Graham. Why do you think your degree, I mean, obviously the the Near Eastern Studies put you in Istanbul, Mm -hmm. but why culture specifically? Yeah, so I mean, it's funny because I actually uh, buck sometimes at the concept of culture in a sociological sense, because I think that it's used often as a blanket term to describe individuals uh, rather than individuals actually informing the culture, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. But at Graham, our culture is very much one that is bottom-up individual defined. And that is something that I did a lot of work on, interestingly, um, with my thesis and kind of arguing against the concept of monolithic top-down forced culture Mm -hmm. and so to be in a company where there is such an embrace on the individual around a group of individuals combining their interests and their skills and their passion and their drive to form a culture you know it's actually been a reflection interestingly of what I studied and what I was arguing against in my studies and also I think that uh, a lot of my work and research was using interviews and using kind of face-to-face interactions which I think allowed me to gain a skill in interacting with people and in kind of communications and stuff like Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, are you a gamer? I would consider myself a mobile gamer. I've always played mobile games as long as I've had a phone. I had, what was it, Scoop It, Scoop Me or whatever on my first iPhone and Super Monkey Ball and all those sorts of things when I was like, what, like 14, 13. But I've actually gained a lot of appreciation for kind of the narrative aspect and the, yeah, the storytelling aspect of games that I think I lacked before. And I'm really grateful to this industry and to the people within it and to the people I work with for kind of opening my eyes to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a Steam account now. <laughs> You've arrived. <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> um, so you said you joined the the people and um, culture team mm-hmm. at Graham. Yes. How did the role um, itself kind of evolve? How was it structured? Mm-hmm. What was the driving force? Did you sort of did yeah. they say okay we need someone to lead our efforts around crystallizing company culture mm-hmm. or was it? you saying, hey guys, I think we could do something a little bit more formal here or a little bit better processed? Well, I think that it was a combination of factors, but I think that Graham has always had a wonderful inherent culture and it's something that the founders hold true. It's something that has always bled through everything the company does. It is informed the games we make, it is informed the way we make games, um, it is informed the way we've grown as a company. But I think that as we began to expand a bit more, we wanted to kind of formulate and crystallize a bit more the way that we were presenting ourselves as a company to the world especially as we were trying to establish a presence and bring new team members into our company. And I think that I you know, offered to and was asked to fulfill the role um, just in that I was decent with 
words and could take <laughs> this thing that was amorphous. It was yeah, it was amorphous and was just a thing that was inherent to what Graham Games did and was central to Graham Games maintenance as a company uh, and be able to express that. I think from someone who is coming from having a more corporate experience prior, I came into the company and I was thrilled mm. about it and I was, you know, happily surprised that uh, that a company viewed their culture so central to what they were um, and so I was really excited to be able to be the person who was able to express that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what does the, what does the day to day look like for you? Oh, it varies. <laughs> um, I think that what's interesting about my position is, uh, you know, I get to be a jack of all trades, and I think a, a lot of what I do is about commun internal communication, mm -hmm. and it's about you know talking to people, understanding what's going on. Um, obviously, I facilitate the more kind of you know operational prog programs we have, like Gram Exchange, uh, which is where people travel between offices, and facilitate sometimes facilitate check-ins, facilitate one-on-ones, facilitate events, workshops, all that sort of stuff. I think it all bleeds into uh, one thing, which is communications and then kind of helping to carry out the actions that those communications are expressing. Let's dive into the core elements of Graham's company mm -hmm. culture, what what it's made up of, mm -hmm. what are the central values. So, you know, it's built around a few things that all I think inform and support each other, mm -hmm. but it's flat structure, open communication, risk taking, being data driven, and we've worked to create the optimal environment where people feel that they can be themselves and they can put themselves out there because ultimately that is what we believe will allow them to try new things and take risks and you know try out new technologies or put a new prototype out there and mm -hmm. basically create an environment where they're not afraid to push the limits of what the industry or what a genre or whatever mm -hmm. says is possible and then yeah the data driven part is also incredibly incredibly important to us because you know in a flat structure you don't have any of the kind of subjective direction coming down uh, you don't have middle managers telling you what to do or you know setting your sprint goals for you like everything we do is bottom up that's sprint planning everything and so the only real authority we have is data and we strive to be data driven in absolutely everything that we do. What does that mean sort of day to day? So I mean for instance where most of our games come from is we have DIY Fridays once a week. They used to be called Prototype Fridays and we expanded it to DIY Fridays because we wanted people to be able to explore other things than simply prototypes on Fridays. So that's t actually 20% of our production time mm. is dedicated to self-driven projects. So on Friday mornings we all get together and we're like, okay, what is everyone going to do today? Like one week I learned Photoshop so my presentations <laughs> could be prettier. Um, I, I started in on Python, didn't go very well, but people will, you know, build tools to expedite our processes or they can work on a prototype. And that's anyone on the team can basically come up with a prototype idea and if they can get a team together to work on it, then they start and work on it. And they set a deadline for themselves. It's usually two to three Fridays. So basically, if by that deadline, they can get a playable build, something that can theoretically be released mm -hmm. to the store, we'll release it and we'll test it. And if it meets the KPIs that we've set for us for, for a successful project, no questions asked, it will be put into production. You know, um, like 1010, for instance, was our first instance of this. This was a, something mm -hmm. that was prototyped. Six was also something that was prototyped and then wasn't made and then was brought back. You know, everything that we make comes in one way or the other out of it, whether it's an iteration on a prototype or a prototype. Mm -hmm. yeah. And why is a flat structure or, or kind of a lack of hierarchy so important? I mean, it sounds lovely, mm -hmm. um, but it also sounds like it could be a real challenge, right? In yeah. terms of, as you said, direction, um, structure, not necessarily, you don't necessarily need to have someone in charge, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's important to have kind of a person you can go to and say, okay, mm -hmm. they'll be a final arbiter. Yeah. Um, one yes or no, whatever it is. Yeah, I think that the challenge of maintaining a flat structure is one that we're willing to undertake. Mm -hmm. Because I think that mobile games and the kind of games that we make, creativity is so central to pushing those boundaries, to coming up with those products that you know millions and millions of players around the world are going to play. And I think that sometimes when you have too much top-down direction, it stifles creativity. It stifles creativity. We hire these amazing people to our team because we respect their creative instincts, because we believe that they have the instincts and the ideas that are going to lead us to have great products and lead us to make great games. Mm -hmm. And I think, first off, once you start giving a little bit of top-down direction, then it can become a little bit more top-down direction. And then it can, <laughs> you know, slope. it's a slippery slope, A. But B, I think that we just don't want them to feel like we are bringing them to the company so that they can make something that we want them to make. We're bringing them into the company because we want 
them to allow their creative energies to be released, as it were. Mm -hmm. Now that you're explaining them, they're very clear-cut values, they're easily mm -hmm. listed, they're easily yeah. explained. How did you guys come to decide what they were, mm -hmm. Um, based on what, how yeah. did you get employee buy-in? Because I, you know, yeah. I know that's that's particularly. Or it it shouldn't be tough because in an ideal world, culture arises from how employees mm -hmm. are already acting, yeah. um, or, or how the company already behaves. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think people can be resistant to having the thing that they just do naturally mm -hmm. put into very pat yeah. words. Sometimes. Well, a couple of thoughts on that. I think that first off, the minute there is a gap between what people within a company believe or are behaving as or whatever and what you're saying the company culture is that isn't a company culture any longer it's it's PR mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> and I think that ours came out of a lot of conversations with employees came out of conversations with leadership with the founders kind of the whole team and it's a totally live product mm -hmm. so it's it's you know there's it's constantly morphing and developing and we have to be diligent and we have to kind of maintain an awareness of it's relevance because, as I said, the minute there is a gap, you're in trouble. Then it's it's yeah, it's it's completely defunct. And I think that it's important to emphasize and to underline that culture is not like a set thing. Like once you set forth those values, it doesn't just remain that. And you'll notice that what I said was they were very basic, mm -hmm. broad values because it's something very amorphous and something very um, alive and something that shifts constantly. You said kind of prototyping is one example of how you, let's say, make company culture actually happen in, mm -hmm. in the real world yeah. versus just kind of um, values. What are some other examples of things that Graham does in mm -hmm. a concrete fashion that really says, okay, this is how we make company culture real? Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of people, it feels very nice to have company culture, but you have to really put your money where your mouth is, and that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean buying a ping pong table. Yeah, um, well, it's such a, I mean, that's such a trope, right? The ping pong table culture. We do have ping pong tables. <laughs> I will tell you, but well, it's, your excuse. Yeah, yeah. But actually, it was a suggestion from the team. Mm -hmm. um, I think a big thing is on a broader level is is maintaining kind of visibility and communication with regards to what everyone is up to, mm -hmm. because when you have a flat structure and you say you have a open communication and you say you have this honest culture and you say that you have this familial friendly culture then you actually have to put that into into action and and one way for us is what well, we have dailies every single day and the whole company uh studios okay and so every single morning everyone stands around it's like yeah i think this is what i'm gonna work on today and this is why and whatever and then also once a week we have uh team check-ins full company check-ins so we have polycom and we get uh, we have stages in each office and we get everyone on the stage and yeah. i put together basically we have a a form that everyone fills in each team fills in i get i put together a presentation that basically goes over okay this was the high level goal for this team this week this is what each person did and it's very much about individual recognition as well so being like yo this person contributed this to the company this week mm -hmm. and this is what it did and this is why they did it and this is the art that this person did and, and it's it's easy to miss those i mean everybody likes yeah. to talk about celebrating wins but it's it's easy to yeah. miss the small ones that happen every day or every week or whatever it might yeah. be yeah and so like for instance when we had a valentine's day event for merge dragons and the art was put up that one of our artists made and the entire company both offices just goes like Oh, and you have this like collective moment of recognition of like how cool what one person is doing. And we, you know, we never want to emphasize the individual over the company, of course, but we want to make sure that everyone understands not only what their own actions do for the company on a daily, weekly, hourly, minute by minute basis, but also what the actions of the people around them are also doing. And mm -hmm. to understand that every single person is contributing something every single moment to the company. Mm -hmm. It's about maintaining that familial vibe where you feel like you're informed. Or like nitty gritty, mm -hmm. how does it help Graham make better games? Well, I think that it actually is conducive to the efficiency with which we are able to put out titles. And um, which you do at a, a very at fast fair, clip. <laughs> fairly rapid pace. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that also like the honesty feeds into planning. When we're setting sprints, the team sits down in a room, they're like, this is what I'm gonna be able to accomplish this week. And it's not lofty and it's not under because they trust the people around them and they're open with the people around them. And also like, you know, with regards to killing games, for instance, we don't work on a project for two years. It's not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Be and because of the culture that we have, if at some point we're like, okay, the data says this and therefore we're going to 
kill this game. There's not like a personal offense mm-hmm. that's taken. I mean, obviously sometimes you're like, oh man, like that sucks. It's sad. Yeah, but that's that's also critical to what we do is is making sure that we kind of cut the line on things that aren't going to work early and not wasting resources, not wasting time on um, things that aren't going to work. And mm-hmm. that comes out of honesty and open communication and being straightforward and feeling comfortable with the people around you. And I think that You know, one more thing is because of the flat structure and because of the recognition and trust that we've worked to build within our company, we've completely, for the most part, cut out that subjective top-down kind of instruction, which I think is actually more efficient in terms of production. So like, you know, a product lead, for instance, like has an overall view of everything that's going on, but maybe they don't understand the nitty gritty of something that's happening on the back end, for instance. And because of the kind of communication that we encourage, we kind of someone's kind of be like, yo, like, I don't think that's going to be possible, or Mm -hmm. maybe we should do it in this way, or maybe we should do it in this way, which I think um, at the end of the day is very fundamental to the way that we make games. And I really don't think that we would be able to produce games in the same way if we had some very bureaucratic kind of stringent processes by which you had to get approval, by which you had to blah, 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 like, you know, ask to be able to do something, wait two days, all this, like, literally in our offices we're all open plan we're all in the same room we can literally run over tap someone's shoulder be like i want to do this can we do this right now what do you think is important for specifically for a game company culture mm-hmm. um that's perhaps unique from other sort of yeah. other verticals other industries well i mean a couple of things but i think most importantly games are fun mm-hmm. <laughs> and i think that you need to ensure that the people that are making those games are having fun, that they're happy, that they're enjoying making those products, that they're enjoying being in their company. Because if they're not, if they feel miserable, if they feel that they're kind of stuck into a certain silo or they're being told to do something they don't want to do, then at a certain point and at a certain level, that's going to bleed into the products that Mm -hmm. they make. And you're going to end up with games that just aren't as fun. Um, So that's one huge thing. And I think another thing is like being in gaming, you're (laughs) fortunate enough to be surrounded by people who are hugely passionate about what they do and if you find yourself stifling that you're in trouble you're in trouble and we kind of have a you know head start on company culture because the people we work with are already working for something that they love and so it's about encouraging that and making sure that they are able to work on and build games that they love and bring those two millions of people around the world and you know if you create an environment that fundamentally uh, foments that fundamentally allows for that then I think that you're, you've already done a lot of the work to, to create and maintain a company culture. You have a, clearly a very strong and solid base in terms of what Graham's company culture is. How has that evolved? And you've talked about it being a live product. Mm-hmm. How has that evolved over the past sort of mm-hmm. couple of years? What shifts have you made um, based on kind of shifts in personnel or, or as the company has grown mm-hmm. and evolved? And also kind of what new initiatives have you brought on? Because mm-hmm. you said to yourself, these are important causes to us, or this is mm-hmm. this is something we see as a reflection of Graham's DNA. A few things. Firstly, I think that establishing our headquarters in London mm-hmm. and expanding our team in that manner presented a challenge to company culture because so much of what we did initially was contingent on the one studio, tightly knit familial culture. And I think that that's actually where a lot of the understanding of the organic nature of culture came from. Mm -hmm. Because you can't force those values. Rather than tell, you have to listen. And that was a big learning that I think came and that's actually, and I think that this understanding of culture as a life product actually came out of that challenge. Rather than saying, this is Graham's culture, as we've expanded and as we've grown in our London studio, we've come to listen more than tell. Do you do you have to localize culture? I don't think so because I think that in both of our studios we have a whole mixture of different kinds of people who, you know, are from all over. We have a whole slew of different nationalities. We have a whole slew of different backgrounds. And also we have, you know, huge similarities in terms of background, regardless of nationality, regardless mm-hmm. of where people are coming from. And I think that we've you know, we have this like pretty international quote unquote culture. Um, in our offices, um, so no, I don't. I don't think so as much. I think that, yeah, the biggest challenge has just been allowing culture to grow and shift, rather than trying to cling to something that, as you grow, might May become be irrelevant. Right. Yeah. And in that, it actually becomes stronger as a culture. Um, what about things like um, Two Tons and mm-hmm. the 22% project? Mm-hmm. Um, do those do you see those as expressions of company culture, or are they sort of side causes that Graham says, no, okay, these are important to us? For sure, expressions of company culture. Firstly, with with Two Tons, we view ourselves as 
coming from an indie background of being lucky enough to have experienced the success that we have and we want to allow and encourage indies um, who are perhaps embarking on the same journey to experience that kind of success and to have the opportunity to have players play their games and I think that that is an expansion of our culture because the inclusivity is something that we really believe in as well our success isn't just for us and then um, and 22 percent for sure we believe that everyone should have equal opportunity to enter this industry and to experience this industry and to take ideas that they have and turn them into games that people play. I mean, it's a similar Mm -hmm. concept, but yeah, what we've done with 22% is, and I think that this is reflective of our culture, is we've just brought people into our studios, shown them what we do, given them the opportunity to be like, hey, this is what a gaming studio is like, and this is what we do every day. And we're not going to tell you that by you coming here every day, you're going to have all of the skills necessary to become a developer, but we're giving you the visibility and the foot in the door to understand what it can actually be like to work in the gaming industry and making sure that these women understand that the gaming industry is one that they could be a part of as well. Um, and I, so I think that, yeah, that's also reflective of our culture. How good do you think the gaming industry is as a whole in building open, honest, safe company cultures? Mm-hmm. I think that obviously there are instances where it has not shown in this regard. But every single year, every single conference I go to, every single event that I attend, there are more and more people who are passionate about this. Every single year, there's more interest in having culture panels and having culture talks in just meeting up for coffee and talking about this sort of thing. And I think that increasingly, because we're a creative industry, I think there's increasing passion for this and an increasing understanding of this. Ultimately, it's pretty obvious, right? The culture becomes a business imperative because when you have a bunch of creatives in in an office space or in a studio or remotely or whatever, you want them to feel like their ideas are respected. And you want them to feel like they can create things and try things and present things to the team that those things will be respected and understood and adopted and whatever. And that's not just like a moral thing. That's like a a business imperative. Mm -hmm. That's how you make games and that's how you create products and that's how you develop things. And so I think that it's increasingly being adopted and that the industry is increasingly looking towards these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Last question. Mm -hmm. What, and this is a tough one, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. What what would be your single piece of uh, most important advice for companies looking to kind of Mm -hmm. start developing or implementing their own company culture? Listen to people. That's it. Just take the time to listen to your team because they spend every single day in your office and so they're going to have the best idea of what is best for the company and what would allow them as the production team as the people who are making the games that allow for the maintenance of your company those they're going to be the people who best understand what is needed and best understand what will best work and as long as you stay true to what people are interested in and what people view as comfortable then that's going to allow you to have a culture that is authentic and a culture that is effective but you can't just sit alone in an office and be like this is what culture is and then this tell is who people, we are this is who we are and then tell people because it's it's not going to work if it's not organic Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much for being with us on the show and sharing all your advice and expertise. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We will see you next episode. PC or mobile? Mobile. Free to pay or pay to play? Free to play. Super Mario or Sonic? Super Mario. iOS or Android? Can I have a second both? If you need it. A both. Shower or bath? Shower. <laughs>